We all remember seeing the Apollo lunar rover on the moon built for space missions in the 70s. Besides transporting astronauts for certain explorations, they were used for taking pictures and collecting soil samples for scientists to study. The vehicle was designed by Boeing, the company famous for building airplanes, and cost around 38 million bucks to build. The kind of loose change you'd find today in Elon Musk's couch. In the far future, technologies will be so advanced that a regular car for the moon will behave like a regular SUV we have today. It'll have a sleek look and might be produced by some famous car manufacturers available. Back then, the lunar rover used a T-shaped throttle to move the car left, right, backward, and forward. The futuristic one can be voice-controlled and require minimal human control. And we can't leave out the Earth roof. Hey, you really don't need a moon roof on the moon. Anyway, the moon's driving conditions are not that extreme compared to Mars or other planets. It's hard to believe that the first landing craft to enter Mars was Viking 1, launched on August 20, 1975. It arrived at Mars on June 19, 1976. But decades later, Curiosity, which had six legs and six wheels attached, took the stage as the cute robot explorer. It was designed for the rough terrain, so in the distant future, a human-operated vehicle can have a similar design for people who want to cruise by the Mars sunset. For any human-designed car to work on planets other than the Earth, they have to be electric or anything else that can produce an unlimited supply of energy. Gas-powered vehicles won't work in the vacuum of space, and certainly not on any planet other than our own. It can be powered by the strong sun and convert the energy to run the vehicle. The interior has to accommodate the extreme conditions on the planet, since the atmosphere is very thin and unbreathable. It has to be very warm, since Mars can reach sub-zero temperatures. The matter of gravity isn't that extreme, but frequent dust storms are the problem. The vehicle will also have wheels attached to legs to maneuver around properly, since the terrain is difficult to get around in. Now, my two cents here? Well, I think an all-leather interior with six-way seats front and back will be nice. Adding a 12-speaker sound system with RU Sirius FM radio is a must. Did I mention the earth roof? Yeah, I did. And don't forget the 6040 fold-down rear seats so you'll have plenty of room to haul your camping gear on your weekend escapes. Meanwhile, it's still possible to have a panoramic glass view of the interior in a project like a tour bus on Mars. There are plenty of locations to discover, like the tallest mountain in our solar system and the snowy carbon peaks. The red planet can also have an express train ride that can take you from one place to another. It'll be one of those luxurious cabins that will take you from one landmark to another since Mars becomes colonized and established. The train will also be electric-powered or powered by another power source. Mars is a place where it's possible to have all kinds of vehicles, since the conditions aren't that different from Earth's. Just don't go outside without a helmet. If we designed a vehicle for Mercury, then get ready for bright light from the sun, in which case we would need to add industrial visors and blackout strips around the glass so that the sun won't get to us. At least we won't have to worry about the heat, since Mercury isn't the hottest planet in our solar system. Well, the temperatures can reach a soaring 800 degrees on a warm sunny day and drop down to minus 300 degrees at night. The vehicle will have to have multiple layers and coatings to withstand the conditions. And it will most likely have spider legs to move, since rubber wheels will melt instantly. And to save itself from damage, it'll need to dig underground to hide from the sun and atmosphere, just like a crab or those spiders that create hatch floors. Driving a vehicle on Pluto will be very challenging, considering that it's the furthest planet from the sun. Now, Pluto is technically not a planet anymore, but it's still a large enough mass to explore. Temperatures there can reach below 400 degrees. A mere jacket won't cut it. The vehicle will need super insulation to keep the operator warm and fuzzy. Methane ice surrounds the land and covers the mountains. Gravity is also an issue since it's very weak, which will make you float in the air. Now, designing a vehicle for Pluto will be tricky. The key for it to move and not freeze will be how the legs move. It'll also have legs like the one on Mercury, but will have a lot of heat generated to keep warm. The weight is enough to keep this vehicle in place. However, that can't be said for Neptune, the windiest planet in our solar system. It's impossible to breathe in the atmosphere, and the atmospheric pressure will crush you. 
Designing a vehicle is challenging, considering the many external factors and will have to be pressurized to counter the external atmosphere. It will also need a special coating to counter the harsh temperatures. And because Neptune is extremely windy, it would need some sort of anchor to keep it in place. Something like a large drill that shoots from the belly of the car and digs underground. It will also have spider legs to move around, but they'll behave in a similar motion to how a camel walks. That way, it can maintain its center of gravity. Now, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, with temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees. The pressure will push your vehicle like a can, so it needs proper internal pressure to balance it out. This car will require all the upgrades for countering the heat. It will need proper coating, no glass, and even a special color to reflect the heat. Nothing can actually stay on the ground for too long, so spider legs won't really work. It'll need to hover slightly above the ground and float around. Now, Saturn is the second largest planet in our solar system and has a very windy upper atmosphere and very strong gravity. The rings around it are made up of ice materials that can range from the size of a pebble to the size of a school bus. The pressure is so strong that you'd be crushed the second you reach its atmosphere. Designing a vehicle would be very challenging and weird. It'll need the best technology for withstanding the crushing pressures and harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be large and composed of many internal layers. Since the upper atmosphere is windy, the vehicle will have to remain on the ground for as long as possible. Scientists don't know much of what the surface looks like, so the vehicle will have to be prepared to move on solid surfaces, liquid, and anything else in between. Now, I think it's called slop. It'll need mechanical arms to maneuver through the possible rugged terrain and multiple legs like a centipede. Those arms can pick up things and move them out of the way if it faces some obstacles. The long body can also detach itself and break into smaller pods for a quick escape. From what, we don't yet know. No human can step foot outside even if they wear protective gear. Robots will have to be deployed to test how human bodies can withstand the conditions. Jupiter has harsher conditions than Saturn, with the red spot being the most dangerous area on the planet. It's an extremely large area that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for years. The vehicle will resemble that of Saturn, but extra heavy-duty. Scientists also don't know what's happening on the surface except for the crushing atmospheric pressure. The vehicle won't be able to move on the surface if it were to pass through the red spot, so it'll have to dig underground and move underneath. For that, it'll require a huge drill and many self-automated drones and vehicles that can be deployed from the main vehicle to help with digging and surveying. Once underground, it'll have legs that will help it crawl and a giant drill nose to dig further. Many of the body parts can also break off into smaller pods to get through certain terrains but can be easily reattached. The craziest place where we can launch a vehicle is the sun. There's no way to imagine it except being self-automated any human on board won't make it halfway in the journey. The launch will have to be from Mercury in a protective facility sheltered from the harsh temperatures. The vehicle will have to be made out of the best resources to withstand the extreme heat and gases and won't last more than a couple of minutes once nearby. It'll most likely resemble a satellite and float around to take some footage for us to study. It'll probably cost trillions of dollars, but the results will be worth it, won't they? If you landed on Mercury, the first thing you'd notice would be how close it is to the Sun. It's actually the closest planet to the big ball of fire and the smallest. But it's not the hottest planet. Venus takes credit for that. It takes Earth 365 days to orbit the Sun, and it takes Mercury more than 3 months. Well, 88 days to be exact. The days are boiling hot, with a temperature reaching above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. But on the other side of the planet, that the sun doesn't reach, the temperatures drop to negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Mercury's atmosphere can't hold any heat when it's nighttime, just like a desert. Deserts have no atmosphere, which is why they have no moisture and no clouds or rain. If you manage to get from one end of the planet to the other and always stay in between the scorching heat and freezing cold, then you can survive. But oxygen isn't a friend to Mercury's atmosphere. 
so you'd just live for as long as you could hold your breath. Plus, there's a magnetic field that has solar winds from the sun that create plasma tornadoes. Venus can heat up to almost 1,000 degrees, but gravity is really similar to that of Earth. You can go for walks by the mountains and even go jogging, but the temperature will instantly melt you, so maybe forget about those jogging sessions. The extreme pressure would also crush you like a can. It's like being half a mile underwater on Earth. So you'd only last a few seconds on Venus. The red planet is home to the highest mountain in the solar system, around three times taller than Mount Everest. And it's also a volcano. Despite being called the red planet, Mars is actually really cold. It needs a little less than two years to rotate around the sun, or 687 days to be precise. And almost like Earth, it has 25 hours in a day. The atmosphere over there is very thin, but unbreathable. The planet has loads of dust storms that cover the entire planet and polar caps that are covered with carbon dioxide. You won't freeze in your spot, but you'd need some thick clothing to keep warm. It's possible to last as long as you can hold your breath. On the bright side though, you'd get to see some incredible views. The solar system's biggest planet is the mighty Jupiter. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then Earth would just be the size of a single grape compared to it. It only needs 10 hours to rotate around its axis, which is a lot shorter than Earth's. One of the best tourist attractions is the Great Red Spot, an area with a hurricane-like storm that's lasted more than 300 years. Oh, and the area is about twice the size of Earth. The largest planet in our solar system needs around 12 Earth years, or 4,307 days, to make a complete circle around the Sun. But Jupiter's gravity is a lot stronger than Earth's. Besides the lack of oxygen and winds that can keep you suspended in the air forever, the immense pressure would crush you. Visiting here won't last longer than a few seconds. Pluto is a former planet furthest from the Sun in our solar system and is now considered to be a dwarf planet. And because it's that far, it's one of the coldest places ever, with temperatures reaching negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely bring a jacket. Or two. Methane ice covers the mountains that soar at over 10,000 feet. Pluto needs 248 years to orbit the Sun. It's technically still in rotation, waiting to celebrate New Year's, but it just needs six Earth days to complete a rotation around itself. And, surprise surprise, the air is also unbreathable. Besides the methane floating around, nitrogen is also pretty common. The gravity is weak, so you'd have to hold your breath while floating in the air before freezing like an ice cube. Again, you'd only last a couple of seconds. The windiest planet in our solar system is Neptune. The core is similar to that of Earth. It has 14 moons surrounding it. A day is kind of short compared to Earth. You'd have only 17 hours in a single day. And similar to Pluto, it needs more than 150 years to spin around the Sun. Neptune is also known as the Blue Planet because of the absorption of the red light by methane in the hydrogen-helium atmosphere. So besides not breathing, the pressure can also crush you, just like on Jupiter. No one can last more than a few seconds there. The second biggest planet is none other than Saturn, with rings surrounding it. From far away, its rings look like one big chunk of rock spinning around. But in fact, it's made up of many layers of ice particles and rocks, ranging in all sizes, from tiny pebbles to bus-sized objects. The rings are shaped in such a way because of the gravity around Saturn. A day on Saturn lasts only 11 hours. It's very windy in the upper atmosphere. Saturn also has plenty of moons like Jupiter. And, just like on Jupiter, you'd be crushed by extreme pressure deep in the planet before you can open your eyes. You wouldn't last longer than a few seconds here, either. Titan is Saturn's largest moon and second largest moon in the solar system. It has the closest Earth-like conditions compared to any existing planet or moon, so living here should be a walk in the park. But the cold weather will freeze you. This moon is actually the only place in the whole solar system that has liquid rivers, oceans, and lakes. They're all covered with methane and ethane, and the atmosphere is very similar to that of Earth. It even rains here at certain times. Our moon isn't so friendly either. Because of the lack of oxygen, you can just last as long as you can hold your breath. The cosmic rays from the sun will also affect you, but skipping along the moon craters is actually quite fun. If you tried going to the sun, you'd vaporize in the blink of an eye. 
The temperatures can reach around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just an estimated measurement near the core. There are still the outer layers you need to worry about that'll also leave you in atoms. Your best bet is to hit the brakes and take the nearest exit. Estimated time on the sun? Less than a second. Our little blue planet is the only place we can live in where an average human can reach 80 years old. We adapted to many weather conditions that aren't crazy, with the gravity just about right so we don't feel crushed. We can live anywhere from dry deserts to snowy ice peaks. It's the only place that has the perfect balance for us to survive. Scientists hope that one day we can live on planets other than our own. Mars is the closest place that can host us, considering we'd have to build a dome in order to live there. Elon Musk wants to use Tesla bots as the first non-human crew to land there and start building our future homes. The robots can acquire information about the planet and mimic the way humans walk and behave, so it'll let us see what we'll need to worry about. In all cases, humans will need to be suited up in order to come close to any planet. Our bodies aren't designed to face such conditions unless we evolve naturally to fit the environment. The tardigrade is the only animal on Earth that can live in the most extreme conditions, from the deepest oceans to the highest mountain peaks. They shot some of these microscopic critters into space and found out that they can live in the vacuum of space for up to 10 days and return without breaking a sweat. They're probably the only known creatures on Earth that can live the longest on any planet except the sun. Scientists claim that if a large asteroid hits the Earth, then tardigrades can perfectly survive. But humans are simply not designed to live outside of Earth without the proper gear. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon, or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury, and right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. And then, in the blink of an eye, you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock. Those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful, it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button, and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that, because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile-thick crust. Then you spot bright, burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. 
What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. Thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. They make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time, the view is different. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. The explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful, gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart, sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. The largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. 
you see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter. That's liquid hydrogen that later turns metallic. And finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the Water Ammonia Ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core made up of iron and other metals. 